Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Michichwa. I'm one of the fellows in uh, gastroenterology, as uh, Dr. Mokoka said. I'll be presenting on uh, further hypertension and uh, ascites. So uh, ascites is one of the most uh, frequent complications of cirrhosis. Uh, its appearance is actually considered as a marker of transition between a compensated state to a decompensated uh, stage of the disease. Um, in compensated patients, the cumulative percentage of ascites uh, development is about 30% in five years. After ascites appears, um, the progression of cirrhosis is markedly worse uh, with a drop in one year estimated survival rate from um, above 90% uh, for the compensated states to 50% uh, in decompensated patients. So over the last 20 years, uh, there's been a great uh, progress uh, made in understanding the pathogenesis and the underlying mechanisms in the development of ascites. Um, this progress in turn has actually made uh, substantial improvements in the management and complications of ascites. Um, this will lead to today's uh, talk in terms of um, um, portal hypertension. We're going to look uh, into the anatomy of the portal system, um, the pathophysiology, management of the ascites. Uh, we'll also touch uh, on tips and the imaging therapies uh, in uh, managing ascites. Um, so in terms of the anatomy, um, I hope everyone can see my um, pointer there. Um, the portal vein is actually uh, uh, made as a confluence of the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein. The splenic vein just before it joins the portal vein is joined by the uh, inferior mesenteric artery. I mean, inferior mesenteric vein. Along the way, it's also joined by the gastric uh, vein to form the portal vein. Uh, then it enters the river to um, diverge into the left and the right uh, portal vein. We will understand more in terms of the right portal vein when we discuss tips. Um, the hepatic vein pressure gradient, um, which is usually measured by uh, inserting a catheter via the portal, um, via the hepatic vein, um, the normal pressures um, detected would be one to five millimeters of mercury. Six to 10 will uh, show a non-clinically significant uh, portal hypertension. And then above 10 will be um, clinically significant uh, portal hypertension. Uh, in terms of classifying um, portal hypertension, we have to classify them as um, prehepatic, uh, intrahepatic, and post-hepatic. Uh, the post-hepatic ones, uh, commonly we have the body carry and uh, constrictive pericarditis, uh, inferior vena cover obstruction, and a right-sided um, heart failure with a tricuspid regurgitation. In terms of uh, intrahepatic, um, we have we classify it as pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal, and post-sinusoidal. Um, this is also important in terms of uh, which diseases affect the pre-sinusoidal. The pre-sinusoidal causes will be the idiopathic portal uh, hypertension, primary biliary cholangitis, uh, sarcoidosis, and schistosomiasis. We do see um, a couple of number of patients uh, with uh, schistosomiasis, though they do present with pre-sinusoidal uh, portal hypertension. Um, the sinusoidal, that's when we have uh, uh, intrinsic liver disease, especially alcoholic associated liver disease, um, cryptogenic cirrhosis, post necrotic cirrhosis. And then, in terms of post uh, sinusoidal, that's um, very rarely we have a syndrome called sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. In the uh, cause of prehepatic um, portal hypertension, we have the portal vein thrombosis, which is quite common. Uh, we often see patients uh, with uh, thrombophilias or the ones with JAK2 positive mutations giving us uh, this uh, condition. Also, we do have uh, splenic uh, vein thrombosis and the underlying risk factors will be as discussed. 
Um, in terms of clinical manifestations of this uh, portal hypertension, uh, we do have uh, patients presenting with variceal uh, um, the varices, presenting with variceal hemorrhages. Uh, when we do a, a gastroscopy, we see uh, portal hypertensive gastropathy. And uh, as we will discuss today, um, ascites, also hepatorenal syndrome and um, hepatic hydrothorax, uh, hepatopulmonary syndromes, portopulmonary hypertension, serotic cardiomyopathy, and uh, portal cholangiopathy. Uh, these are the uh, most common clinical manifestations, not forgetting um, uh, IPAS plenism with splenomegaly. Um, in terms of uh, pathogenesis, there are a couple of theories that um, have been brought forward, uh, um, but the most uh, the adopted one and the most uh, recent one is the uh, forward theory, which we will go through. Uh, we will skip over the overflow theory and underflow theory uh, for this presentation. Um, for the forward theory, what we do have is uh, when a patient with, with cirrhosis um, and subsequent uh, portal hypertension, we do have uh, vasodilator mediators, um, mainly the nitric oxide, but there are a number of other uh, postulated uh, vasodilators that include glucagon, prostaglandins, um, VIPs, and uh, substance P. Uh, these vasodilators, they, what subsequently happens is that we do have splanchnic arterial uh, vasodilatation. Um, also, at this point, um, when we have splanchnic arterial vasodilatation, what we have um, is a reduced effective um, arterial blood volumes. Um, this, I uh, will discuss what then happens with reduced effective arterial volume, but also when there is splanchnic arterial vasodilatation, we do have what we call a forward increase in the splanchnic capillary pressures and the uh, permeability, and also with lymph node uh, formation, hence the um, name forward theory. Um, in patients with cirrhosis as well, what we then have is um, um, we can also have bacterial uh, translocation in terms of uh, pathogen associated molecular pathways. And from the damaged liver, we have the, um, the damage associated molecular pathway. Uh, this also leads to the um, activation of the innate uh, systems and uh, the resultant of a pro uh, inflammatory, um, pro inflammatory cytokines. This is also contributes to this plunging. Um, arterial vasodilatation with subsequent reduction in the effective uh, arterial volume. Um, so also contributing to the reduced uh, effective arterial volumes in most patients with uh, cirrhosis is the reduced uh, cardiac output. Uh, mainly sometimes they do develop cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. It doesn't always happen, but they can happen. And that also can contribute in terms of reducing the effective uh, arterial blood volumes. Um, once we do have, once we have the reduced effective arterial volumes, what we then have is activation of the RAS and the sympathetic um, silver systems with subsequent sodium retention and free uh, uh, solid free water retention. With that, we then have seepage of fluid into the uh, peritoneal cavity, the development of uh, ascites, also dilutional, hypo, um, dilutional hyponatremia with uh, subsequent in other patients developing a hepatorenal syndrome. So this is um, the forward theory that is uh, proposed in terms of the pathogenesis of ascites in patients uh, with uh, cirrhosis. Okay, uh, apologies. So in patients, um, we are going to evaluate our patients now with uh, ascites. Um, firstly, we are going to grade uh, our ascites in terms of our clinical presentations. Um, we grade ascites into either grade one or mild ascites, which is only detectable by uh, ultrasound uh, examination. And grade two is moderate ascites, um, which is there's moderate symmetrical distension uh, of the abdomen. Um, grade three is large or gross ascites that provokes uh, marked abdominal distension with often um, you know, leading to patient discomfort, sometimes splinting of the diaphragm. 
um, evaluation of ascites. Um, so we do have, um, when we have a patient with ascites, we need to perform uh, a diagnostic uh, paracentesis for patients with grade two and grade three um, ascites or in any uh, patients with non-ascites, but now presenting in decompensation. Um, in terms of once we do uh, take the fluid, we have to send it for analysis uh, with the main focus on the, the uh, neutral flow count uh, for which uh, 250 cells uh, per microliter is key to us in terms of diagnosing uh, spontaneous bacterial parasitosis. We'll come to this later when we do discuss about uh, SBP. Um, we do send patients, um, I mean, the fluid for albumin uh, so that we can calculate uh, serum acetic uh, albumin gradient, we call it a SEG. Um, and this, when it's above 11 grams um, per liter, it has got a 97% accuracy uh, for uh, defining portal hypertension. Um, we do also send this fluid for a total protein um, keeping in figure that a total protein of, of, 15, of less than 15 grams per liter is actually a risk factor for developing uh, SBP. So it is key that we do send not only for albumin, but also for total protein of the fluid. Um, we have to send the fluid for culture and we, have to, we recommend that uh, we send at least 10 mils um, of the fluid in a blood culture bottles. Uh, so we send both uh, two bottles, but at least 10 mils of the acetic fluid. Um, so that means, you know, when we're doing an acetic tap for as a diagnostic parenthesis, we actually need a larger volume, not just only a 20 mils range. Perhaps a 50 mils range would be better if available. Depending on the clinical presentation, we also want to send this fluid for TB, um, cytology, um, amylase, and uh, triglycerides. <laughs> Um, in terms of overview of uh, managing ascites, I put this uh, table, uh, it actually gives us a brief summary of you know, the approach when we are managing these patients with uh, ascites. So um, for grade one uh, ascites, as you can see here, we only have a sodium intake restriction. We will discuss sodium um, uh, intake uh, restriction at the moment, I mean, uh, shortly. For patients with grade two ascites, um, we do recommend that um, according to ESO guidelines, um, sodium and diuretics and parasynthesis for grade three ascites. However, the first line treatment, let's not forget, is the treatment of the underlying disease with nutritional support patient education. And once we have this patient um, encourage or actually discontinue other medications like NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors and um, angiotensin receptor blockers. In terms of dietary uh, sodium, uh, so in terms of figures, the moderate uh, restriction of sodium is actually recommended, which is uh, 4.6 to 6.9 grams or 80 to 120 millimoles per day. However, uh, it's very difficult for us to recommend to say these figures uh, to patients. What are we going to advise the patients? So the general recommendation is that it's a no added salt diet um, to, our, to the food. Also, we have to avoid prepared food. So this is what we are going to tell our patients when you are recommending a moderate or a restricted uh, sodium intake. And then in terms of estimates uh, to 4.6 to 5 to 6.9 grams, if you can take an average of five grams, so five grams is actually equivalent to uh, a teaspoon of salt. So this is how much we are actually restricting ourselves in terms of uh, salt per day. But however, as I insist, as I said, when we are recommending to patients, it's a no added salt plus no uh, prepared food. So that means takeaways per se. And avoid a very low sodium content diet as this is associated with a diuretic induced hyponatremia and renal failure. Uh, in patients that has not developed ascites and they are serotic, there is actually no data to support a prophylactic um, use of salt restriction. Um, diuretic usages, uh, we recommend when we're using diuretics, the anti-mineral corticoid drugs are the mainstay of therapy. As we saw from the 
uh, pathophysiology. Um, the RAS system plays a major role in the pathogenesis of ascites. So the main uh, drugs there are the um, anti-mineral corticoid in form of spironolactone. We use high dosages uh, compared to our cardiology counterparts. Um, we use at least from 100 milligrams up to 400 milligrams per day uh, of uh, spironolactone. Um, Apleronone uh, is another uh, anti-mineral uh, corticoid that is available, but we don't have any state. Um, I'm not 100% sure in private practice, but it is um, in uh, other drugs that is uh, of choice. The advantages to that compared to spironolactone is that it's less androgenic. Uh, and also has got less uh, uh, progesterone, uh, anti-progesterone effect, meaning that our patients with, our male patients with pain for gynecomastia as a side effect of spironolactone will have benefit on this and also reduced libido alteration in the menstrual cycles in females is actually less with a plenaron. However, it is expensive and its availability can hinder its use. Um, we do recommend a loop diuretics uh, once we, uh, our um, anti-mineral corticoids are not effective. Uh, we start at a dose of 40 milligrams of furosemide up to 160 milligrams um, of furosemide per day. However, we do not recommend the use. Um, it is not recommended to use the uh, loop diuretics alone without the anti-mineral corticoid. Um, the aim when we are giving uh, diuretics is to lose half a kilo per day in patients without edema, and about one kilo per day in patients with edema. That's why uh, in our inpatients, we do recommend daily weight because we want to check on the effects of our diuretics, and then we can use that as a guide to titrate our uh, diuretics. Um, once we have, um, we have grade one or grade two ascites being controlled by or even grade three being controlled by diuretics, we have to reduce to the lowest effective uh, dose uh, just to minimize the uh, side effect. So what are the questions that we have to um, take when we are using uh, diuretics? We have to watch for renal impairment. We have to watch because patients, we can actually precipitate a hepatic encephalopathy with the uh, use of uh, uh, diuretics. Um, we recommend that we stop the uh, hypo, I mean, we stop diuretics when the sodium is 125. Uh, serum potassium to stop when it's below uh, three or above six. Uh, we are not usually worried when it's around 5.5, but above six, we recommend to stop. However, in an ICU setting, we can actually correct this uh, and not um, necessarily having to stop uh, these uh, diuretics. Also with diuretics, watch for uh, muscle cramps that can be stubborn. Um, managing of ascites with large vorum paracentesis. Um, large vorum paracentesis is, I mean, it's actually a quite safe procedure. We often do it bedside. Um, however, the use of um, ultrasound when we're doing paracentesis is a good clinical practice. Um, we have to be cautioned. We have to use sterile precautions as we may, <laughs> Uh, contaminate the um, peritoneal cavity. Um, we have to avoid this in our uncooperative patients, um, in patients with uh, abdominal skin infection at the proposed puncture site, we have to avoid this. Also in pregnant women, in patients with severe coagulopathy, EDIC, we have to uh, avoid this. Um, severe um, bowel distension, um, hence the use of ultrasound can actually find that uh, where you proposed to inject, to put in your needle, there is um, bowel there that is probably distending and not necessarily acidic fluid. Um, the complications that can come with uh, large volume uh, parasynthesis uh, is post uh, parasynthesis uh, circulatory dysfunction, which may actually present as worsening renal failure, uh, dilutional hyponatremia, um, also worsening in uh, hepatic encephalopathy, also associated with uh, decreased survival. Uh, well, how do we prevent this uh, development of post parasynthesis circulatory dysfunction? We uh, use albumin 
20% added dose of uh, 8 grams per liter infusion for patients with large volume paracentesis. Large volume paracentesis is anything above 5 liters. Um, so a meta-analysis of uh, randomized trials showed that uh, albumin is actually superior to any other plasma expanders that could be available uh, or vasoconstrictors in terms of preventing uh, post-parasynthesis um, secretory dysfunction. Also, it's been found that it's actually uh, better in terms of preventing hyponatremia that can ensue uh, when we use um, large volume, when we do large volume parasynthesis, also there is a decrease in mortality compared to other um, plasma expanders. Which other plasma expanders uh, are there? Uh, they could be dextran 70, artificial plasma expanders, or even a uh, saline uh, solution. So albumin is better. Um, in terms of um, refractory ascites, there are definitions uh, that comes with it. Um, the first one is uh, when patients have diuretic resistant ascites. How do we define that? This is ascites that cannot be mobilized or the early recurrence of which cannot be prevented by uh, because of the lack of response to a sodium uh, restriction and uh, diuretics. Um, what is early acetic uh, ascites um, recurrence? This is reappearance of grade two or grade three ascites within four to uh, within four weeks of initial uh, mobilization. And then uh, diuretic intractable ascites. Uh, this is ascites that cannot be mobilized or uh, the early recurrence of which cannot be prevented because of the development of diuretic induced complications that we did mention earlier. And that will preclude the use of an effective dose uh, of the diuretics, uh, remember the maximum doses that we alluded to earlier. And what is the diagnostic criteria for this? Um, so the in terms of treatment duration, um, so patients must be on intensive diuretic therapy, as we said, spironolactone, maximum 400, or aplenolone, if available, maximum dose, and um, a, a loop diuretic, furosemide, maximum 160 milligrams per day for at least one week and on salt restricted diet. And then there should be lack of response, which um, is defined as loss of 0.8, uh, um, I mean, loss le less than 0.8 kgs over four days and urine sodium output less than the uh, intake. Early acidic um, recurrence, we mentioned that less than four weeks post um, mobilization. And then when there's development of uh, diuretic induced um, complications, that will be the diagnostic criteria for our diuretic resistant and diuretic intractable ascites. And how do we manage this? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so one way of uh, approaching uh, refractory ascites is to um, put in what is called a transjugular intrahepatic photosystemic shunt, which is the TIPS. Um, how it works is that we have um, we have a shunt that is created between the portal and the systemic circulation. The systemic circulation, so we the in, introduce guide wire uh, via the inferior vena cava, so you use the um, internal jugular vein via the inferior vena cava, and then the right hepatic um, veins or the middle hepatic vein can be used. Um, in other words, patient must have had um, good imaging to ascertain uh, this vasculature. Then they introduce a guide wire to join uh, the portal system via maybe the right uh, portal vein. Once the guide wire is introduced, then we can put in um, a stent to bridge the two. So what we're saying is that there is increased portal pressure here. Um, and then once we create a shunt, we decompress this system. So all the pressure goes via this way instead of going via the uh, liver parenchyma. So this is essentially how the uh, tips uh, work. Um, this often results in effective uh, uh, volemia uh, in about four to six weeks and uh, resolution or improvement in, uh, in ascites. Um, other indications that we do use uh, for um, 
uh, this procedure, the TIPS procedure, is when we have um, uncontrolled variceal bleeding. So we want to reduce the portal system pressure uh, as early or as rapidly as possible. So we do create this shunt and then we reduce the pressure. And then subsequent to that, we have decreased pressures in the um, variceal veins. This does control the, the, the bleeding quite often. Um, we have to look at the contraindications of TIPS. What do we have to watch for when we are considering our patients for TIPS? So we have the absolute contraindications and relative uh, contraindications. Um, on the absolute side, uh, we have a con uh, congestive heart failure. Um, this is obvious because we are decompressing the system um, this way. So what we are doing, we are increasing the preload. So in a patient with um, heart failure, so this often results uh, in worsening heart failure. So it is absolute contraindication. Also similarly with tricuspid regurgitation. Also in patients, uh, we have to evaluate, when we're evaluating patients with TIPS, uh, cardiac echo, evaluate the um, pulmonary arterial pressure, contraindicated when it's about 45. There is a relative contraindication for moderate, which is between 35 and about 45. It's, it's a relative contraindication as well. When there's an active a systemic infection or sepsis, it is a contraindication because this often leads to you know, colonization or infection of the tips, leading to what we call a tipsitis, which is often fatal. Um, when there is un, um, unrelieved biliary obstruction, um, so sub, look as we can see on this diagram, this shunt passes through the liver parenchyma, so we do not want to pass a shunt when there is an uh, unrelieved biliary obstruction because again, pass through that obstruction and uh, create more problems uh, for, to our patient. So it is an absolute contraindication. Uh, other relative contraindications um, include patients with hepatic tumors, um, hepatic encephalopathy. But, um, actually in patients, there are various grades of hepatic encephalopathy. In patients with OVET, like grade Two, I mean, grade three, grade four, it is an actually an absolute contraindication in this case because it does worsen um, our problem. Uh, patients with portal vein thrombosis, patients with thrombocytopenia um, have relative uh, contraindications to uh, TIPS uh, insertion. Um, then complications of that can arise uh, when we are. Uh, putting in a tips, um, they are procedure related um, tips, which can be anesthetic uh, complications, inadvertent puncture of the uh, carotid arteries, um, things like that we have to watch for. But uh, in general, then we have to divide them into early post procedure, which is day one to 30 and late um, post procedure, which is above 30 days. Um, what can arise within the first 30 days is cardiac arrhythmias, hematomas at the puncture site, worsening, or we can actually precipitate hepatic encephalopathy with our tips. Um, the progressive heart, uh, hepatic failure can worsen. Uh, so in patients with MELD above, MELD score above 18, uh, we know that they've got uh, about a three month mortality, which is higher than our patients with a MELD of uh, less than 18. So we can actually worsen patients with uh, hepatic encephalopathy. Also, the shunt can actually thrombose or the shunt can migrate as you saw from the anatomic depiction uh, that I gave earlier. Um, late procedures, um, hepatic encephalopathy can occur at any time. Uh, liver failure uh, can actually precipitate uh, portal vein thrombosis. Um, and then uh, progressive uh, hepatic failure, as I said earlier, the shunt can stenose or can be thrombo can actually thrombose. Liver transplantation. So I recommend we recommend early uh, referral to our hepatology um, for our patients to be considered uh, for a liver transplantation. This is a multidisciplinary team. Um, when patient is referred for um, liver transplant, we do a thorough assessment to our patients involving um, pulmonary, uh, like respiratory assessment, cardiology assessment, psychosocial assessment, and the team you know, involved in deciding whether the patient is for liver transplant or not involves the surgeons, 
involves the anesthetist, involves the social worker, involves the psychologist, psychiatrist, the pathologist, uh, to name uh, but a few. Um, this provides definitive uh, therapy for our patients with uh, refractory um, ascites. However, the waiting periods is long. Um, we have other um, modalities that are coming up uh, for our patients with um, refractory ascites. Uh, the first one uh, is the alpha pump. Um, what this pump does is subcutaneous pump that is um, pumps ascites from the peritoneal cavity into the bladder. Um, as we can imagine, uh, this procedure is not, um, you know, trouble free. Um, there is frequent catheterization of the bladder, there could be bleeding, could be infection, and often patients develop uh, renal failure. And this uh, pump they, doesn't offer any mortality benefit uh, in terms of um, the, um, the disease uh, that precipitated the problem. It actually only relieves um, the ascites. And problems in, 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 in series that have been done, they were between 30 and 50%, which is associated with this alpha pump. So this is an emerging thing, but it's not, um, you know, it doesn't come with no problems. Also, um, lately, um, you know, there is an understanding that the thoracic duct, uh, the, the, lymph, um, the, venous, the lymph node, the lymphoid system, um, it does play a role in draining excess fluid, that, uh, but however, it's not good enough to clear the ascites. So, Latest therapies have emerged, which is the lymphovenous uh, junction stenting. Uh, so this will be, for example, um, our thoracic duct here. Um, this is a lymphograph of the thoracic duct um, joining the left um, subclavian vein. So we actually stent it from the basilic vein on the left, on this side, and then place a stent. Uh, so this, in case series that have been documented and published lately, like uh, 20, actually this year, it has been associated with improved um, uh, ascites in patients that were noted to be contraindicated for TIPS and still um, to be evaluated for uh, liver transplant. So, but however, the data, as I said, is limited to uh, case series. Um, I think that should end my, no, not yet. We have more slides, but I think I've got five more minutes. The spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, this is bacterial infection of the acidic fluid. Um, patients often present with signs of peritonitis, uh, systemic inflammation, systemic inflammation, uh, worsening of the liver function. They can have worsening of uh, hepatic encephalopathy. They can present in shock or uh, renal failure. Um, the, when you do an acidic tap, um, for we have to send, as I said earlier, for a neutrophil count. A figure of 250 and above uh, denotes um, SBP. Uh, we send fluid also for culture. The culture can be positive or can be negative. In, so we denote that as culture negative uh, SBP, but we do treat. In other patients, we do have neutrophil counts that are less than 250, but when we send the culture, the culture comes back as positive. We call that bactericitis. Um, how do we treat? When the patient is symptomatic, they have bactericitis, we treat as SPP. If uh, they are asymptomatic, uh, a repeat um, culture or, and uh, repeat neutrophil count is recommended before treatment. Um, when you, on the acidic culture, when you grow multiple organisms, be wary of uh, secondary bacterial peritonitis and not necessarily SPP. Uh, the treatment uh, that's uh, recommended for community acquired patients that present uh, from ED, um, third generation kepharosporins or piperacin tazobactam will be the first line treatment. In patients that we think it's a nosocomial spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, we recommend carbapenems. Um, albumin at a dose of one gram uh, per kg at the diagnosis and one uh, one gram per kg on day three uh, is also recommended.
for the treatment of uh, SBP. We can give this albumin as an infusion. The uh, prophylaxis uh, with nofloxacin is recommended for patients that uh, has uh, had SBP. Um, yes, those were my last two slides, and these were my uh, references. Uh, thank you very much. I open the forum for questions.